Okay. Hello, this is Pastor Ken Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. I'm inviting you to worship at our congregation at 400 North Swinton in Delray Beach in person at 1030 and 830 as well as online at 1030 and 830. And then inviting you to join our Bible study comes on Sundays at 10 a.m. And we welcome you to our study of this question, who is Jesus? This Bible study going into what the Bible says about Jesus. So let's get started with this statement, Jesus, true God and true man, what the Word says about the Word made flesh. You might recognize that hymn. Some find it very difficult to sing because the rhythm is not normal. And if you've ever heard it played to um, an organ with an organ background, there are tied eighth notes in triplets and dotted eighth notes. It is, uh, it is difficult to learn. I think that most congregations would have their choir sing it. But last week on Sunday, Bobby Clem sent me this hymn and um, what you were hearing was the tune to this creedal hymn. And why is it called a creedal hymn? because it confesses what we say in the creed. It's paraphrased. Mm -hmm. These are not the same exact words in the Apostles or Nicene Creed. But you can look at it with me. It's a confession. We all believe in Jesus Christ, his own son. And that's referring to the first stanza of the hymn, which confesses what we believe about God the Father. His own Son, our Lord, possessing an equal Godhead, throne and might, source of every grace and blessing. Born of Mary, Virgin Mother, by the power of the Spirit, word made flesh our elder brother, that the lost might life inherit, was crucified for all our sin and raised by God to life again. That hymn goes way back um, mm -hmm. several centuries. And we still confess this. Now, if the tune is hard to sing to, no, the stanza confessing Jesus Christ is still a beautiful thing. And I encourage you um, to have a hymnal in your home and use it for your private devotions. I have found that very useful over the years. And I think you know from past lessons how much I value and love uh, the hymns that have come down to us. Well, there's one that you could do. And thank you, Bobby, for sending that to us. Um, uh, I, uh, you are a great one. So here we have a thing that well, today is, what? what is the date today? 11 or 12? The 12th. The 12th. Well, that's um, 13 days until we celebrate this event that divides um, BC and AD. The uh, word was made flesh. And many artists have uh, put their colors to the canvas and they have described it. And what have you done? Many of you have put up a major scene in your house someplace and you have everyone there in wonder and awe at this event that is one of a kind. It leaves you breathless you cannot describe it. 
It's just a baby. Oh, no. Mm. Wow, oh, this is God becoming flesh, putting on our nature in order to save us. And we could stop right there and we'd have a, a beautiful lesson, wouldn't we? But I want to go on with you and uh, look at these two things. Jesus Christ, true God, and true man. I don't think you would think about that a lot. But you believe Jesus is true God, and you believe he is also a true man. He didn't seem to be a God. He was God in the flesh and still is. He didn't just seem to be a man. He was a real man who walked and talked and cried and slept and got tired and <laughs> all the things that we do except sin. And he was distinguished from all that existed. He was and is one of a kind. The person and works of Jesus is the general title of our study. And that sounds awfully theological, doesn't it? So we're going to make it a little bit better by dividing it into two parts. We can talk about the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, what in the world was deity? And why do we use that word? What does deity mean? God. It means God. It's from the Latin, Deus, which is a word for God. So the deity of Jesus Christ is the description of Jesus as true God. And then the one that is easier for us to understand, because we're human beings, the humanity of Jesus Christ. But he was humanity in a special sense, in that he was without sin. Otherwise, he was just like us. All right? If you saw him, if you lived at his time and you saw him walking, you'd say, there's a man. And you would be right. So let's go on. This is the mystery that we discover when we read the Bible. When you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and you read what St. Paul, the apostle, said about him, and what St. Peter said about Jesus, and what John said in his letters about Jesus, and in the book of Revelation about Jesus, you're going to discover the mystery you've heard about for many, many years. And that is true God and true man in one person. That's the mystery. Now you can shake your head and say, I don't know how that can be, but your doubts won't erase the fact that Jesus is true God and true man in one person. There are two natures united. There are no descriptions that I can make. People have tried, and I'm not going to list the, the things that people have used in order to uh, talk about it. But, uh, you know, when we try to describe something and we don't have the right words, it is better for us to stop trying to describe the indescribable, right? Yeah. So we'll just talk about the two natures united in one because that's what the Bible says about him. And after we discover in the scriptures the two natures united, then we'll also consider two questions. Not We're not going to get there today, but two questions we're going to discover. Why was it necessary that Jesus Christ be true man? Well, I like to scratch your heads a little bit. And before I answer it, before I go to the scriptures to give answers for that question, let's see what you have um, tucked away after years of going to church and learning and hearing sermons and going to Bible classes. Why was it necessary that Jesus Christ be a real man? Carry out prophecy carry out prophecy. Good. More. 
he had to come down and physically die for us to save us. He would have to be man in order to die for us. That's, right. that's, that's correct. And also, uh, he came down and he did um, the many miracles. I mean, he was real. Um, the disciples that wrote about him saw him and witnessed him. So um, they yeah. knew he was real. He was a real person. He would have to be really there for that, for them to see it and hear him. Yes. Why? I I think he had to tell us, being a, a a person of God, that God was there and would forgive us before, without, with him being the sacrifice. But, you know, that's kind of what I mean all in there, as opposed to the way the Jewish people did it. He, he was there to tell people that he came to forgive sins. Yes. Right. right. <coughs> Why did he have to be true man? Yes, that's right. Good answers. So why did he have to be true God? He was hard. God. He, he, he was and is, but why did he, why was it necessary? That's a harder question, isn't it? Right. Well, we'll get there. All right. You see, we can be patient and, uh, let your noodles think about that a little bit. All right. Jacob. Jacob. Let's talk about the deity of Jesus Christ. And well, let's let the Bible talk about the deity of Jesus Christ. So we have lots of reading for you today. Yeah. So Jesus is Lord. How do we know he is Lord? Uh, Judy, why don't you lead it off by reading this? Uh, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you all do that. You and I confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. Someone has said that that is the shortest creed in the Bible. Three words. Jesus is Lord. Well, that tells us that he is Lord. And the word Lord in the Bible is reserved for the Lord who is God. Or better, the God who is the Lord. There are other small g gods who are not gods, but this is the God of the Bible revealed. Lord. And that has lots of meanings. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. So your belief in the resurrection is part of your faith. It's a necessary part of your faith. All right. The Lord is our Savior. He is our <clears throat> Savior. You're correct. So he is also true God. And you don't think about this a lot, I suppose, because you think of creation as re reserved for God the Father. But the works of the Trinity are united and uh, our assignment of one to the other is based on uh, scripture passages. And here's a scripture passage I want someone to read uh, about Jesus as creator. Okay. John 1, 3, all things were made through him, the word, and without him was not anything made that was made. Thank you, Dee. All things were made through him. Right in the first part of John's gospel, he confesses the truth about his Savior and ours. All things were made through him. All right, another passage, uh, someone else who has not read. I'll do it. <clears throat> Colossians 1, 16 to 17. For by him, the Son, all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. Well, that's rather complex. Yes. A complex compound sentence. Let's break it down. By him, all things were created. We've got that. And I've got it underlined for that purposes. Uh, right. And the, uh, 
when Paul writes this, he's not trying to give a catalog of the whole universe. So he says, there's two things. There's the earth that we're on and everything else are, is categorized as heaven. We don't have telescopes in St. Paul's time, right? And we don't have uh, those people who have, oh, they saw the stars in the heavens. And the astrologers. But, yes, this, uh, they did. Uh, there are things that were made that are visible, all right? But it's interesting that St. Paul, before the microscope, before all of the things that were discovered about the structure of the atom, there were things that were not visible, and those were made by him too. And there are thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities all over the world, and they exist and were created through him. And this is interesting, for him. Because he is Lord of all, and he rules over them. And he is before all things, and that is in regard to the Christ is with the Father and the Spirit, eternal, without beginning, without end. And that's all I'm going to say about that long passage. Do you have any questions, though? Do you have anything you wonder about? Okay, we can come back to it any time. We can come back. Here's a short one for somebody who hasn't read. I'll read it. Colossians 2, verse 9. For in him, Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. In Christ, the whole fullness of the deity. There's not, he's not part God. Mm. He's not one half God. As though we had one half man and one half God. He's all man and he's all God. And in him, the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. Well, I can't explain that. Except to say that it's true. This interesting question comes up. If you don't ask it, then uh, I could let it go by and never, never bring it up. But I wonder about it. You see, you have St. Paul, who was not on the scene when the word was made flesh and the babe was brought forth from Mary's womb. He wasn't there. I think and sometimes by trying to explain it, we get ourselves in trouble, too. There are things that are unexplained. There are things that are mysteries that will remain mysteries and we may never know. That's, that's or right. understand, I should say, understand is a better word. They were not given for our understanding, but for our faith. Mm -hmm. And that's the division. <clears throat> so our faith believes what our mind cannot explain, and we leave it at that. And actually, that's a very comfortable place to be. So we have St. Paul, to whom these truths were revealed. That's the point I was beginning to make, that he is the one who was taught by Jesus in a special way that uh, we don't have knowledge about. He went into Arabia for a time, and he might have consulted with the risen Christ then. Beside those two, uh, the, the, the one, he tells it three times, beside his mm. being accosted, how about that word, uh, visited uh, by Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, there were other times that it was revealed to him, uh, these truths. And um, that's a mystery that has never been revealed to me. Is to, uh, if you read the letters of St. Paul, you say, how did he know all that? Well, one reason he knows all that is that he is digging into the Old Testament scriptures and finding Jesus Christ as the supreme and only uh, revealer of all the prophecies that were concerning him by the by Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Well, I won't dwell on that mystery anymore. All right. But he, he is true God. Here's another passage from the letter to the Hebrews about Jesus as the radiance of the glory of God. The glory of God is the sum total of all the attributes of God. You know, his strength and his wisdom and his power and his might and his forgiveness and his compassion, and his love, 
and you got another two dozen or so that you can list. All of that, the radiance of that glory of God and the exact imprint of God's nature. That's what Jesus is. And not only did he create, he also upholds the universe by his word of power or the word of his power. It can be translated either way. So we have a strong Lord who is the exact imprint. The Greek word in, in behind that is icon. Mm -hmm. Icon. Not the kind that are on your screen. Not the kind that are in the Eastern Church as figures in, in the uh, worship uh, in the church. Uh, not those kinds of icons. But he is the real thing. He's, he's the real deal. The exact imprint of the nature of God. We'll leave the mystery. Where, Go ahead, Chris. Like, that must be where the, the Greek icons in the church get that from, though. They interpolated, or whatever the word is, you know, from that. They have decided that it is helpful for us to see with our eyes what the words are saying. Yeah. An icon is not a hindrance or a problem. It's certainly not a sin if you, if you make sure you don't worship it. Uh-huh, right. Now, when Luther was reforming the church in the 16th century, he did not throw out all the icons. Yeah. Some people in his day did. But he said, if these things are useful to teach people, we will leave them. If they're contrary to the gospel and, and hinder people from the truth, then we will remove them. Yeah. And you recall that he taught by pictures. He had people, artists, who would depict uh, an event in wood uh, carvings, and those wood carvings can be used uh, to, to print pictures. Yeah. Hmm. I remember uh, a very difficult thing that we did in junior high school is they gave us blocks that had some type of carvable, carvable material on them. And the challenge was to carve them in order to make uh, something that would print. So you put it on. Like, was it linoleum? I, the yeah, I think, I think it was linoleum. You're right. Well, so you make an imprint of an image that you have in your head. Hmm. So that's a, a type of icon. Because it represents the real thing. It's not the real thing. But when, when Jesus was the imprint of the nature of God, he was and is the real thing. He is God in the flesh. There, I'm probably spend enough time on Hebrews 1.3. Let's go on. Stop me anytime if you have a question or a comment. You're here with us. Someone read, uh, we're back, I think, uh, to Judy. Okay. Jesus is true God. John 14, verse 9. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Wow. If you have seen Jesus, you have seen the Father. Mm -hmm. True. Because he is the exact imprint of the glory of God. Mm. So Philip needed a little of instruction. And now because Philip was bothered by this, we don't have to be bothered by it because we have Jesus telling us, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, you and I haven't seen Jesus. Not in person. Not in no. person. Not in person. But how, how have you seen him? Through his people on earth here. You Yes, that, uh, Matthew 25 and 24, I should say. But you also have seen him through the depictions, the stories, the parables, the the gospel writers wrote down what they saw and heard and right. touched. 
there are some, you know, artifacts, question, uh, artifacts that have been. We um, we can't. <laughs> I know if you were there, you saw things, but you you don't have historical verity. No, I know there's always been question, and I, and I think I I'm not sure if they ever have uh, satisfied. Was it the shroud? Um, I don't know about that. That may have, that may have, uh, but you know, it doesn't matter whether it is or not. Yeah, you know, someone has joked that there are so many slivers of the cross <laughs> that have been put around the world as true slivers of the, 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 the real cross of Jesus that you could uh, build a cathedral with those. <laughs> Might be an exaggeration. But people have worshipped these artifacts, and that's why I reacted suddenly to you, Judy. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. Um, well, he, I, I, just, I mean, wouldn't belief, you know, if you believe, you will see in your mind? I suppose there's something to your picturing in your mind what you believe. Mm -hmm. But you're going to, you know, you're talking to a pastor who believes in the centrality and the exclusivity of the Bible as the only revealer of what is true. Mm -hmm. I have no other source for my teaching. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you do have other sources, we'll talk about that sometime. But it, they are not as reliable as these 66 books that are inspired by the Holy Spirit according to their own witness of themselves. They're self-authenticating through the Holy Spirit. So we'll move on to Jesus is true God when Jesus said, I and the Father are one. You know, they're very similar to saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Right. Now that word one is, is one person. No, that's not true. There are two persons. I and the Father are one. One God. One eternal being. Again, uh, you're, you're right, Judy. We can't explain it. Mm -hmm. But we have this John, to whom this truth was revealed, that Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And notice that Jesus does not explain that. Okay, swallow these things with the heart of faith. And don't let the thinking part, the analysis part uh, of your thinking process tear it away. Jesus is true God. Now here are two passages that come together. Read the prophecy, someone. I will. I oh, I'm sorry, someone else wanted to? I'll try it. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall, host, shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 7, verse 14. Right. You probably memorized that about uh, oh, 35, 40 years ago. <laughs> the Lord himself will give a sign. That's what, mm -hmm. that's what the prophet Isaiah said to... the king the virgin will conceive and bear a son now what happened in the new testament bobby you go on to read matthew 1 23 behold the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name emmanuel which means god with us well the truth here that were is revealed is that jesus is true god because here we have the virgin bearing a son. That's Jesus. And shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, what in the world does Emmanuel mean? Well, Matthew explains, doesn't he? God with us. And uh, this is often hyphenated, God hyphen <clears throat> with hyphen us, because it's one word in the original. So you see how these two go together? Matthew knows the prophecy, and he's quoting it. 
and then he explains it, which means God with us. And so this son that is born to Mary, the virgin, they called his name Emmanuel. Now, nowhere else after that is, um, is Jesus referred to as Emmanuel. He's referred to as Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, and some other titles and names, the Christ, but not Emmanuel. <coughs> but here that, that says that the prophecy of Isaiah was fulfilled. Got it? Yes. That means he's true God with us. The person and work of Christ continues with more statements, more, yes, about Jesus as true God. I didn't list them all. It would take a long time for us to read the 14 I am statements of Jesus Christ. I am, can you think of some of them now? I am the Lord and Savior. I am the Good Shepherd. Yeah. I am the way, the truth, and the way. Yeah. Good. I am the light of the world. Remember that? The light of the world. Yeah. I am the gate. No one comes into the flock except through me. So those statements, the reason they show he is true God is when Jesus says, I am, he's the I am of the Old Testament. Moses said, how am I going to tell them who you are? What will I say? Mm -hmm. And God's answer was, say that I am sent to you. No one else uses that but Christ. And then there's the Isaiah 9, 6 prophecy. The child in 9, 6, you know that list of, depending on how you put the commas, there are seven things about the Christ. We sing them in the Messiah. Anybody going to a Messiah concert this year? You can find it online. You can go to YouTube. <laughs> it's not the same as being there, but if you long for a, a hearing of the Messiah concert, you can go and listen to the whole thing. And Isaiah 9, 6 is one that Handel uh, quoted in the prophecy. And one of those seven things about the child is the mighty God, the Prince of Peace. Everlasting Father. The everlasting Father. You see how, how this is all tied together? Mm -hmm. Isaiah 43, prepare the way of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Who said that? Isaiah did. Isaiah, I was just going to say. Oh, but who else said it? John the Baptist. Yeah. Because the prophecy becomes fulfilled when John the Baptist comes on the scene and he says, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Yeah. And that's what he came to do. John the Baptist said, I am the one that Isaiah spoke about. Prepare the way of the Lord. And you can go and read that in Luke chapter 1 and in Matthew chapter 1. All right, let's go on and talk about the humanity of Jesus Christ. We're making a lot of progress here. Our quilter has come home. I hope she joins us. The humanity of Jesus Christ. I don't think you have as much uh, difficulty with this part of the truth of Jesus that he's true man. Someone read, please, uh, the next passage. Okay, Chris. Um, Hebrews 4.15. Jesus is true man. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus mm -hmm. is our high priest. But just because he's the high priest doesn't mean he doesn't understand how difficult it is for us to resist sin. He sympathizes. He knows our weaknesses. You know that in the, in the favorite hymn? 
Jesus knows our every weakness. Mm -hmm. But in every respect, he has lived on this earth. His feet got dirty. Right. Walking in sandals in the yeah. unpaved roads and yeah. highways uh, of the, the, the Holy Land. And that one thing changes everything that he was without sin. All right. He's true man. Here's another passage. Another reader, please. How about Evelyn? First Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Well, there's a lot in those two verses. One God, and there's one mediator between God and men. The man is a real man. And he gave himself as a ransom. And he had to be a man in order to do that. As you said earlier, he had to be a, a man to be able to die for us. Right. And Paul said, this testimony was given at the proper time when he came to do this. All right. He's true man conceived by the Holy Spirit. You know that. And we celebrate that if you want to. We could celebrate it. Some people and some churches do. On what mm -hmm. date would they would they uh, would they celebrate this? Well, we'll read the passage first, someone. Matthew one nineteen. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Thank you. So at the Immaculate Conception? Right. Of whom? Mary. Of Mary. Oh. I'm pretty harsh when I say no, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> I want to nip it in the bud. This is the Immaculate Conception of Jesus. There is no there is no immaculate conception of Mary in the Bible. Okay. And, Jesus. <laughs> okay. All right. Now just I just want to make sure that we get that right. Um, because too much false doctrine gets peddled out in this world of ours by improper speaking. So that's my job. My job is to pull the reins up tight when they need. Okay, but it doesn't mean I don't love you. I just I love you enough to correct you. <laughs> All right, and that's I know what you meant, the the immaculate conception of Jesus, Jesus. and we don't often use that word uh, in our speaking because people uh, brought up in another uh, faith group uh, will misunderstand us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say here is from Matthew one nineteen that this child was conceived, but you didn't answer my question. If you were wanted to celebrate this in the church, when would you do it? I don't know. Oh, gosh. Nine months before Christmas? That's right. <laughs> on, on March 20th. Well, and we don't know that Christmas is really the truth. That's day. right. That's right. But if you... If you hold to let's celebrate Christmas on the 25th of December. Like we do. Like we do, do. We could <laughs> celebrate Jesus' conception on March 25th. Yes. And, and if you go around, you, you might find a church or two that, that's, that, that has a, a service of uh, Jesus' conception. That's, it would be rare. The eyes of March. <laughs> No, no, no. That's the, no. That's the 15th, <laughs> I think, isn't it? Uh, yeah. My mother was born on the Heights of March. Mother-in-law <laughs> was born on the Heights of March. <laughs> Let's go on. Uh, Jesus is true man conceived by the Holy Spirit. Another passage, and this is the one that uh, Joseph needed. Go ahead and read. 
Matthew 1 20. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. All right. Joseph had to get that same message. Mm. Otherwise, he would have put her away. He would have put her away. The King James has privily, <laughs> uh, privately. He would have divorced her as he had the right to do if she was found to be with child by another man. Joseph, no, there's nobody else, just you. And after word, he took her as his wife. All right. Jesus is true man conceived by the Holy Spirit. Another one from Luke 1, 35. Who hasn't read for a while? Bobby Glenn. Luke 1, 35. And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So this speaks a little bit to the deity of Christ because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And there here's, here's another mystery for us. We have God the Father sending forth his son, born of a woman. But how does he come into the flesh? By the third person of the Trinity, by the power of the Spirit. You and I probably don't think of the power of the Holy Spirit all that much. Hmm. But there it is, the power of the Holy, of the Most High. So the Holy Spirit has given another title there. And the child to be born will be called Holy. He does not inherit original sin. That makes Jesus different in a way that you don't think about very much. It is true that he was tempted as we are all tempted. Mm -hmm. So he didn't commit any actual sins. But also Jesus did not have that which we are born with. It is the propensity to sin and that original sin which we inherited in a mysterious way passed down from Adam and Eve to all who are descendants of them. And everyone is a descendant of Adam and Eve. Now we have this exception that Jesus is true man born of a woman who takes his substance from her, just as all babies in the womb have that beginning. But he didn't have a father. Well, there's a mystery you can't explain either. Isn't it full of mystery that Christmas I was going to say, I was just say, sitting here thinking it really be have, it really would have been hard growing up as a sibling of Jesus. <laughs> he was always perfect. Yeah. There have been some and you problems. and you might not be, of course. Yeah. I, I won't tackle that today. <laughs> I, if you if you born if you were in a large family, you had that. <laughs> there was always one perfect one who was better than seemed to be able to and got better presents too i suppose but let's not go back there the christmas i was talking about the wonder of christmas and here we have these mysteries that are all enfolded and it's more than lights and candles and trees and presents it's it is god coming as one of us Sometime I'll recite the parable that Paul Harvey used to. He used to do it on Saturday noon broadcast, the Saturday before Christmas about the birds. You remember that one? Everybody ever ever heard that parable? Oh, if Hello. you haven't, if you haven't I'll, I'll bring it to you. I have a copy somewhere. Uh, evidence of G Jesus' humanity. 
Romans 1 verse 3, the gospel concerns God's son, who was descended from David according to the flesh. There's that word flesh, meaning he put on the, the garments of humanity, the flesh and bones. Evidence of Jesus' humanity, here's another one. We're just going to read a lot of them here. That's about a half a dozen. Uh, just, just read them. Luke 24, 39, evidence of Jesus' humanity. See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. Hmm. That's after the resurrection, Jesus said that. Uh. When he met them in the upper room and they were surprised. They thought he was a ghost. <laughs> Go on. Uh, then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Oh, these are kind of out of order, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is... Uh, okay. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah. Oh. But he is, a, his humanity includes that he had a human soul, mm. a psyche. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another reader. And at the, uh, Luke 2 21, and at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. This is a little like, and Paul makes the comparison in Colossians, I think it's chapter two, that uh, we are now circumcised, but not in the flesh, because baptism corresponds to circumcision. It has, in a way, uh, replaced circumcision as a something commanded by God. Now, Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day according to the law of Moses. And the reason it is similar to our baptism is that is the time that he was given his, what we call his given name. How did they know to call him Jesus? Angel said so. <laughs> See, it all comes together. And Luke 2, when you read the Christmas story, and I really recommend that, I don't know what other devotions you're doing for yourself this time of the year, but if you read the Christmas story, and it came to pass, uh, Luke chapter 2, he used to memorize it in the in the in the Christmas plays. Uh, read the whole chapter. Okay. So you get uh, you'll get Jesus going all the way to age twelve. Mm -hmm. If you read Luke two. But the the wonderful thing about it is, when it's all over, it says Mary pondered all th these things and treasured them in, in her heart. That's what mothers do. Mm. Mothers watch their children in a way that fathers don't. It's, it's the maternal instinct, it's the maternal care, it's a special kind of, of love I, I won't go into detail, but you've all experienced it. You know, unless for some reason you were separated from your birth mother. More evidence of Jesus' humanity. Three passages. Who's got a good running start to this, this slide? Matthew 4, verse 2. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. John eleven thirty five, Jesus wept. John nineteen verse twenty eight, 
Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. Now, why did I put those passages up there? What do they mean? He was human. He was hungry. He wept and he was thirsty. And he was hungry and he cried. Yeah. We have a lot of evidence for his humanity. And you knew these things. But I'm putting them all together in one place. Mm -hmm. All right. And you haven't done this before, maybe. Okay. Not since catechism. <laughs> evidence of Jesus' humanity. We have this the same passage that uh, before. Uh, we had this passage before that he was like us in every respect as we are. You know, all the organs that are in our bodies, he had those same organs. Mm -hmm. Liver and, and stomach and pancreas and spleen. And, he had all those things. Don't ask me, though, if he had an appendix. <laughs> or or things, things that we no longer need. Did he have those back then? Don't ask me uh, biological questions, I will, I will say. I will mm -hmm. give you the answer I love to give with a shrug of the shoulders. Okay, more evidence of Jesus' humanity? Someone read this from Matthew, please. Matthew 26, uh, 36 through 38. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Hmm. Knowing that he was going to suffer the sins of the world, I cannot begin, I won't even try to imagine. Hmm. His humanity was evident on the cross when he did what? Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. Different pronunciations. I wasn't going to ask you to stumble over it. Uh, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. The accent might be different. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Forsaken me. To be forsaken of God mm. was something that only Jesus has suffered. Now, I'm going to explain that a little bit. One aspect of hell is to be forsaken by God forever. And until someone goes and experiences that condemnation, they would not ever know what it was like to be forsaken of God. But Jesus suffered that ultimate punishment. The evidence of his crucifying, being crucified for us, is more than that he died and that he bled, which is, those things are certainly true. He bled and died for us, as the hymns all celebrate. But he also was forsaken of the Father. Can you explain that a little further? Does that mean like when he went to hell for three days and such? No, no. That, that first Peter passage about uh, descending to the lower parts is another doctrine which i'll cover in another lesson but okay. it's not it when people recite the apostles creed i'm almost certain that 80 percent believe he descended into hell was the same as his being forsaken of god on the cross hmm. the we believe and teach according to first peter and i'm i don't have the passage in front of me i won't take time to try to look it up in a hurry but the passage has to do with his victory it is the first step in his exaltation 
as I think I had on the whiteboard many, many months ago. Okay. You see, when you recite the Re Apostles' Creed, you are reciting his humility, born of a virgin, born, born, suffered, crucified, buried, okay? Those are descending. Okay. And then the ascension, not the ascension, the, the exaltation, I should say. But he, I don't want to- He wanna, descended into hell to show uh, his power over the devil, that he defeated the that devil. That he was victory. And mm -hmm. to those spirits kept in, in chains. And that, that's gonna take a, way too long for me to get into today. But I'm here, uh, the evidence of Jesus' humanity is that as a human being, he suffered the abandonment of the Father. That's all I wanted to get out of this slide. But mm -hmm. of course, that other doctrine comes up and thank you for at least mentioning it. Mm -hmm. More evidence of Jesus' humanity? He yielded up his spirit. Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Now, this is a good place to stop. I think that's why I had put in this, uh, I call it a clean slide, no new subjects, because according to my watch here, we have been going for somewhere around 52 minutes. And I aim to keep it under an hour. People cannot um, absorb more than about this amount of attention, especially in the doctrine concerning the deity and humanity of Christ. But without going on to other slides, I'm going to pause and ask you, do you have questions or things you wondered about? When did God say, I will never leave you or forsake you? That sentence comes from Hebrews chapter 13. But you will find evidence of that same promise in other places. Right. Um, none come to mind right now. What else do you wonder about? Pastor, what about the parallel parallelism with uh, the 40 days in the wilderness? as far as Jesus' humanity and having to deal with uh, the devil, too. I, in, in a sense, he had to do both. Yes. Uh, man and, and also God. Well, of course, most of you know that 40 in the Bible is a, is a period of preparation. Um, 40 years in the wilderness. So Jesus yeah. suffered uh, the self uh, fasting of 40 days and he was hungry and the devil comes and tries foolish yeah. devil <laughs> I always say foolish devil did you really think you could hoodwink Jesus the Christ <laughs> well the devil doesn't have faith he has nothing but doubts so his mm -hmm. knowledge of Jesus is fragmentary and he has the three temptations so jesus has to suffer as we suffered and overcome how bobby did he overcome temptation uh by um using scripture against what the um satan was saying exactly to remember now right now your family over here is going to be happy that you still remember what he taught you in uh, catechism 35, 40 years ago. It, it's even getting longer now. It's getting longer. Well, I'm giving you the benefit of a few years doubt here. I, I don't ask people how old they are. Okay. It's just a number. So you remember that he did suffer that. And he did that for us to prove that this is how 
and to show us, to teach us how to overcome temptation. Is have the word of God dwelling you in you so richly that you can say, be gone, devil, I know all about your tricks. <laughs> uh, cast away from me, uh, my flesh. You should not want what you want. And you turn away. And when the temptations of the world come, you say, I don't need that. I can do without that. Get behind me, devil. Remember when the uh, wish book used to come in November of every year? <laughs> what was the wish book? The Christmas catalog. Yeah. Both Sears and <laughs> Montgomery Wards. Montgomery Wards. Uh, <laughs> Um, are we, did you want us to still be recording, Pastor? Well, I wanted you to ask questions about today's lesson. Okay. No, I don't want to get on that tangent. Okay. No, we're, we're about done. But if you have questions about the humanity or deity of Christ. So that's why I put you full screen that you could seem like you were in the room together, not looking at the slides. Well, that's good. I, I, I want to pray with you and ask you to continue to pray with, uh, by the way, let's include one prayer. I try to keep them private and out of the recording, but I do want you to pray for Francis Kilper, who had a pacemaker installed and will probably be released from the hospital today, according to her daughter. Oh, gosh. She had a rest rate in the 30s and 40s mm. of the heart and so she went to delray medical center so we continue to pray for her <laughs> i wanted to get that out to you and i promised mm. her daughter that the bible class would pray for francis okay. lord god uh you have given un unto us all the things that we need to believe about jesus your son and we confess that he is your son, the Christ, the son of the living God, and that in and through him we have forgiveness of sins and life and salvation and all the gifts of the Spirit and everything that we need to fight temptation. Lord, be with us in these hours as we approach the celebration of his birth to keep the one thing, thing central, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh to be our Savior. And in him we find truth and light. We pray for those who are sick, especially for your servant, Francis, that she might be rescued from fear now that she has a pacemaker and then she is able and, and willing to go forth and serve you as she rests uh, from this surgery. Grant her peace and good health, we ask, in the name of that same Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you, Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.